inauguration. Uh, this is one of those really great opportunities that comes sort of once in a lifetime, right? Uh, I'm Harry Hayward. I'm with Media Relations and Communications here at the University of Washington. And uh, what we wanted to do tonight was one of a series of what we call UW Insight. Uh, UW Insight is about us being able to share with our public the thoughts that we have on things that we know something about. Uh, this is a great institution of great minds of a whole variety. Uh, we had the financial crisis lectures about uh, the 1st of December. And gee, that's still going on, so we're going to maybe bring that back again. Uh, tonight, it's all about the power of digital media. And uh, just so you know, this was all put together in about two weeks, and we can thank the power of social media for getting all of you here and getting you all to find uh, what you're going to find out tonight. So um, we've got some great presenters. Um, we're going to put this on video so that we can have it streamed as a video on demand for you to watch over and over if you want to. Uh, thank you for coming, and uh, enjoy your night. Thanks for that, Harry. My name is Hanson Hossein. I'm the uh, director of the Master of Communication and Digital Media program here at the university. And um, it was, I just want to tell you how this event came about very quickly. I, um, I'm, I'm going to quote directly from the email that I wrote when I had this streak of uh, this, this inspiration. Uh, hi, that's Harry. This is Lance. Hi, Lance and Harry. The strange appearance of the sun at lunch cleared my brain for a brief shining moment to come up with this idea an MCDM-sponsored event for January called The First Social Media President, How Obama Uses the Internet. So this, um, this came about when the sun last made its appearance here in Seattle. And, <laughs> and I think it came out a little bit today, so I think it's all very fortuitous. But it's, it's something that we've been paying really close attention to in our Master of Communication program. Uh, we focus on social media storytelling and basically the business of communications using technology such as digital media. And for us, it was a... Uh, it was this, this incredible, it was, a, it was a moment to see Obama win uh, for many reasons, but the fact that he had been able to leverage a lot of the technologies and platforms that we've been talking about in our program made us feel like we were on the right track. And the fact that some of the people here on this panel tonight are, are telling me that their phones haven't stopped ringing since then because there are just so many opportunities uh, using these new communication tools sort of tells me that this is something that's worth uh, discussing that we that there's some lessons to be drawn from how Barack Obama used this. Also, this gives us a, the inauguration next week is a great news peg. It gives us a chance to create community here in the Puget Sound area to talk about these really important issues related to communications. And this is something we're trying to build through our program and through our new center that we're building called the Media Space, where we hope to have a lot of events like this on a regular basis, bringing everybody out in the community to talk about this and try to figure it out. And so this is just the beginning of that. Um, and, and this is just a significant time. Uh, just listening to the radio today on KUOW, they had Don Tascott who wrote the book Growing Up Digital and then Grown Up Digital. And he announced that the net generation has just elected their first president. And to me that was very, uh, it was a very prophetic thing to say. It was a very momentous thing to say that we have now moved beyond um, what other generations have dictated, and now we're looking at younger generations using new technologies, and they're having an impact on, on, on how we're using technology and how we're governing ourselves as well. And also, I, I, you know, we, we can be very utopian about how, how all this is, is, is happening, but I, uh, I got a Twitter from one of my students in the last couple of weeks uh, about this event, and I, and I thought it's worth at least uh, throwing a little bit of cold water before we think that we're now moving into a shiny, a shiny happy moment. He said to me, it's less remarkable to me that Obama used digital media so well than that the other guy bungled it so badly. Politicians or anyone who wants to communicate need to understand the media of their time. And this time around, the media happened to be Facebook and Twitter. McCain's performance on the media of the Times was comparable to Douglas showing up at the Lincoln-Douglas debates, muttering something about Lincoln's beard and falling off the stage. <laughs> so, it might not, might not be a fair point to begin with, but I thought it was a very, it was a well-written, uh, I think it must have been an email, because that's too long for a tweet, but uh, I think the author is here. Yes, uh, you, can, you can yell at him later. Anyway, I'm just so thrilled to have the three people who we, uh, will be talking about this tonight here, because I see them in their own ways as leaders in terms of the use of social media. Um, Lance Bennett, 
uh, he uh, is, a, is a professor both in the political science department and in my department of communications. He's a colleague and a friend and uh, has been really at the forefront of how uh, people are using digital media and communications generally to get more engaged. He's, he's a true expert on the use of communications democracy around the world. He's a rock star not only, not only in our department, not only in the university, but he's recognized across this country as a real expert on this. So I'm thrilled that he agreed to, to participate. So we'll kick off with Lance, who will actually look at specifically what Barack Obama and his campaign used and what it means for politics and democracy. Uh, secondly, we have Kathy Gill, who's right here. Kathy is my colleague in the Master of Communication and Digital Media. Kathy is, um, she's the quintessential early adopter. She knows this stuff before it's even happening, and I go to her to, to, to educate myself on this. And she's, she's a journalist. She's been teaching in the MCDM for seven years now, Kathy? Six. Six years. Um, she also teaches motorcycle safety. And I, I just I feel like Kathy really gets this, these tools, and she just taught a really successful class in digital democracy, which just happened to be taking place during the, the apex of the campaign. And so she's got some great observations, and she also, you know, she'll also be realistic about what this means as well. And then finally, we have Brett Horda, who's here. Brett is a good friend of our program um, and a collaborator of, of ours. Um, Brett's famous for having been the social media director on the Pickens Plan, which is a really successful campaign that T. Boone Pickens ran in the last few months. And he also uh, did a Facebook application for Your Revolution, which allowed people to register online through Facebook to, to vote in Washington State. And so Brett is just one of these people you know you'll be reading about if you're not already in the next five years. And I just felt it was really important for him to take the conversation beyond so what what the, uh, the, the younger generations are using this technology for, and also to look at it from a business point of view. So that's the order of the day. But with that, I give you Lance Bennett. Thank you. Thanks. Is this working? Yeah, it sounds like it's working. Um, I was on vacation when I got this email from Hanson, and I thought, there's no way we're going to fill a big hall here in two weeks when everybody's on vacation. Turns out I was wrong, and I'm wrong for the very thing we're talking about tonight. Twitter and Facebook and networks and lists all went out, and you all responded, and it's a very interesting audience. I'd like to find a way to see where your networks are in here. That would be an interesting uh, thing to, to discover. The snapshots of the election I'm going to give you are a kind of a back burner project powered by students at the Center for Communication and Civic Engagement. It's not one of our funded research projects, but it's one of our really fun research projects. And a lot of the things we do um, are based on students coming to me and saying, we have to look at this because it's happening now and it's important and let's do it. And so I'm uh, happy to credit Roosevelt, Hussein, Dean Freeland, and Chris Wells, three students who work at the center who've been capturing and helping me gather uh, data and insight uh, over this election period. The mediascape is changing. We all know it, but when you begin to see it from a perspective that isn't sitting in front of a television, it really looks like it's changing rapidly. So here are the big media players, not just today, but increasingly so in our future. And as you can see, some of these small players uh, are, are actually shrinking in size. Here's the nightly news, okay? That's uh, where citizens once got their information and really aren't anymore. Are they getting it somewhere else? Well, the answer is no. More and more, except for the old folks uh, in my bracket and above, are going newsless. Is this something to be alarmed about? That's a really interesting question. The question I want to pose to you is actually becoming answered by polls and studies that suggest well, people are actually often going online to have direct experience. Instead of hearing a reporter stand up in front of a candidate who's talking, but you can't hear what they're saying, you only hear what the reporter tells you they're saying, people can go online and actually hear the speech whenever they want, as much as they want. So it could be that bypassing news, while it is sad for all of my journalism friends, and colleagues may indicate a kind of a transformation of the way information is getting to people. So we should bear that in mind. 
one of the things that strikes me as fascinating about this election is that the Obama won in a digital landslide. If you look at the activities on any of these and a host of other kinds of digital media, social networking <coughs> technologies, Obama won. These are just some quick snapshots. Facebook, 3 million to 600,000. MySpace, 930,000 to 222. And these are just the, the, the close friends. Um, they're surely more distant friends. If you look at blogging activity, there was just one week in the entire election span that Obama wasn't the most blogged about by far, and that was the, the Palin moment. <laughs> but as we know, that passed rather quickly. Um, this is some data that John Hickey gathered, uh, who's here tonight. At the end of the primary term, you see 40 million YouTube views for uh, Obama, and um, Clinton has less than 10 million, and McCain kind of flatlined on YouTube, as he did most of the way through the campaign until they finally figured out how to prime the media space. And for a period during the summer, they were more viewed uh, than Obama was. So how much viewing was going on? By one estimate, 3 billion video views. That's a lot. I mean, that kind of swamps what we think of as mass media. 3 billion video views. Uh, the YouTube campaign channels. Obama, 112 million to McCain's 25 million. The Obama edge is, is reportedly 2 to 1 in views. This is an interesting moment. I mean, a lot of people think that YouTube is a really tacky place which is dominated by Beyonce and Britney and really idiotic videos. Well, it turns out that in November, Obama channel beat out the Beyonce and the Britney channels. Um, so it suggests that it's becoming a place where people go for direct information about the candidates and the campaigns. And this is an interesting picture. We think of mass media as being the targeting device, the strategic targeting device to pump ads at undecided voters in key battleground states. But it turns out that the, the, the device that really impressed me most in this campaign, and this comes thanks to my colleague Bob Boynton at the University of Iowa, is these are targeted YouTube videos on the Obama channel. The, the darkness of the color indicates the density of the targeting. And the content of these videos is about campaign events that occurred in those states. So these are not Obama's race speech. These are not the big acceptance speeches at the Democratic Convention. These are local content videos that were targeted. And you can see there's a strategic pattern here to the targeting. Florida, uh, Virginia, North Carolina, Ohio, Michigan, Colorado, and then the other states that were in play in New Mexico and Montana and, and North Dakota. Also states that were surprisingly in play in this election and were strategically targeted with local campaign content by the Obama campaign. So this may become uh, the targeting pattern of the future. So one thing that I've noticed about the, the viewing patterns and the content is this. Here's a 37-minute speech that got 7 million views. That's the size of a nightly national network newscast. And it's kind of impressive that 7 million people wanted to go to the source, unmediated by journalist sound bites and, and cutouts, and look at this speech. And then it went on because it was blogged about. In fact, it continued to be blogged about all the way uh, through the election itself. Some of the content wasn't so serious. <laughs> but it might have been engaging. Um, and it also got large views. So, so there's a combination of seriousness and play in this election uh, spectacle. <laughs> this was the most viewed video, 22 million views by Will I Am's uh, Yes We Can, 
produced by Jesse Dillon and, and released on MySpace and YouTube, uh, and blogged about very, very heavily. This was also the most blogged about video in the entire election. Um, and it indicates that, that there is a mix going on, but it also indicates that there were a lot of things that were very important to mobilizing voters for this campaign that weren't controlled by the campaign. This was a digital network that was interacting with the campaign, but not as centrally controlled as uh, you usually see campaign content. There were discourses going on. So after the Yes We Can video came out, uh, a group of fairly low budget producers, the Yes We Can was a high budget production, produced the No You Can't uh, McCain ad. If, if you haven't seen these, please go and watch them. They're quite hilarious. Um, <laughs> One of the things we're studying about all of this is how does video go viral when it's not traveling through the normal media channels, the mass media channels. And one thing that's very clear is that there are interactions going on between desktops, such as the desktops of Joe Cook, who, who co-produced his own video, speaking to Mr. Obama on behalf of McCain, urging voters to vote for McCain. I'll show you the video in a second to bloggers who blogged about it, and as the blogging moved up the food chain of the blogosphere, you began seeing conventional media grabbing it, talking about it, and reporting it. And I'll show you that in a minute. So, so this video was produced in a park in a small town in Illinois, and it's now got 13 million views. This was the second most watched video in the entire campaign, and it was not produced by McCain. And let's look at it. Dear Mr. Obama, having spent 12 months in the Iraq theater, I can promise you this was not a mistake. I've witnessed firsthand the many sacrifices made for the people of Iraq. Those sacrifices were not mistakes. The Iraqi people are just like us. They want a chance to live in a secure world, free from tyranny, free from terrorism, free to prosper, free to raise their children and pass on a future. Are they better off today than they were in 2002? You bet. I've seen many men sacrifice their lives for the Iraqi people. They died for a purpose, not a mistake. They died giving hope. They died promoting freedom. Do you rescue a fireman just as he's about to save a child? When you call the Iraqi war a mistake, you disrespect the service and the sacrifice of everyone who's died promoting freedom. Freedom carries with it a price. Because you do not understand nor appreciate these principles, sir, I am supporting Senator John McCain for president. He too made a huge sacrifice promoting freedom because he understands a fundamental truth. Freedom is always worth the price. And I'm proud to be an American where at least I know I'm free and I won't There ain't no doubt I love this land God bless the USA And that ad was not approved by John McCain, although I think he was very grateful for it. Uh, it appeared first on a very small blog in this small Illinois town, a blog about what's happening in our town. And it worked its way up the blogosphere until it hit large enough blogs that it was um, picked up by Rush Limbaugh on his radio program. Rush turned it into an anthem for 9-11. And within the week that this appeared on Rush's program and in turn uh, Rush Limbaugh's blog, it spiked to six million views in one week. Um, so you can see the blogging activity and then the spike in views, and then it spiked again uh, in terms of blogs at the end because it became a rallying uh, discussion point for, for the vote itself. We've tracked a number of others of these and there seems to be a pattern. It's an imperfect relationship, so we're looking more at how blogging interacts with viral video and uh, trying to figure this out. 
So here's some takeaways. What's the bottom line for this, this campaign? Well, three million donors gave six million plus donations, both records, adding up to 500 million, also a record. We might worry a bit about how much this Obama campaign cost, but that's another question. These are amazing figures. Uh, and they were mostly under $100. So that large amount of money was contributed in small uh, average donations. An email list of 13 million names, wouldn't you like to have that? Um, a billion emails landed in inboxes. Uh, a million people signed up for text messages, and um, on and on. So it was really quite, quite an astounding set of digital media and networks. And one of the things that impresses me the most is the youth engagement that resulted from that. Here's a survey of voters 18 to 25. And 57% believe that they were more engaged in the election, not more connected to Obama, the candidates, but more engaged in the electoral process. And one of the things that we, especially I, have worried about for years in my own work and as a citizen is the disconnection of young citizens uh, from the democratic process. And here is evidence that the interactivity with an election campaign re-energized a, a substantial segment of, of young voters. And did it matter? Yes, it mattered. The blue lines are all states, many of them very unlikely states. Alabama for Obama in this age bracket? Very interesting. North Dakota, Kentucky, Kansas. So, so you can begin to look at, and then look at, at North Carolina, 72%. That begins to look like a, a youth vote turnout that might have carried a state that would not otherwise have gone. So this is kind of where the young engagement went. So I'm going to end with just some what's next, uh, and then turn it over to, to Kathy and to Brett. Um, well, what's next for Obama is that they surely covet their takeaways. So they've got, look at that email list. Look at the mobile phone numbers, the, the, the donors, and they're already using it. How many have already gotten their mails after the election asking various things about what you plan to do? So, okay, we know how this audience voted. Um, <laughs> But what's interesting is that not only have they been using their list in getting ready to govern somewhat differently, although they're still asking me for money, but, but somewhat differently than they used it during the election, the people on the list side and the text message side of the communication exchange fully expect to be involved. Look at that, 25% of the voters expect to support the administration's agenda by reaching out to others online. That's, that's a large number of activists for an administration. 51% uh, of online supporters expect some kind of ongoing communication uh, and, and so on and so forth. So, so these voters want to stay mobilized and I fully expect that the administration will keep them mobilized and it will be very interesting to watch how that works. Um, they ask those on the list, what would you like to continue doing so that they've got feedback about what kinds of action uh, their supporters could contribute? The fireside message of the digital era. I, I think that one of the things that's going to be very interesting to watch is the weekly messages that, that come out and that will enable Obama to not just interact with large numbers of people directly, but for these messages to become shared and mashed up and posted on YouTube and sent in various forms uh, to people who wouldn't ever see them on TV or hear them on the radio. So that's the snapshot of, of the campaign uh, as I saw it and my students saw it digitally. And uh, thanks. <laughs>